Welcome to Dear SQL DBA, a podcast for SQL Server database administrators and developers. I'm Kendra Little. This week's question is about index maintenance and performance in SQL Server. Specifically, is it possible if you change your index maintenance for that change you made to slow down queries that run later on during the day after the index maintenance is over, even if the change you made was to improve your index maintenance? Like, could it slow your stuff down? We'll talk through that. I think it's a, it's a fun one that we're gonna dig into. Before I dig into the main question today, though, things I've been thinking about this week. Well, today I've been working on my new course about bullying execution plans for sqlworkbooks.com. And it's on hints, all sorts of different hints, table hints and query hints, and using plan guides to apply hints or freeze plans. Also using the query store feature in 2016 to freeze plans. And one of the, the interesting things that I was thinking about today is, is a process challenge. So let's say I've got an environment where performance is really important and I'm running SQL Server 2016 with Query Store. We have this query we find that is sometimes fast and sometimes slow, and we intervene to freeze the fast plan in production using Query Store. We freeze the plans and it's going well. It's performing consistently. What do we do process-wise to reflect that and to make sure other teams are aware of it? Now, it, Query Store is a part of the database and it is gonna back up with the database. So I can restore, you know, that when I restore the database elsewhere, if the plan is frozen, it will restore that way. But, you know, in most environments, we don't always, you know, constantly restore and refresh our dev environments. Often refreshing a dev environment is something that's only done periodically so we don't cause chaos in there. You know, often if we're making a change in production, like changing an index or adding a hint, we're gonna check that into source code. But if we're freezing a plan, huh? Like if we freeze a plan in query store, how, how do we check that into source code? What would be the process equivalent of that? So if you are using query store in production and you actually have a, a process where you're like, eh, here's how we handle that. I would, I would be really interested to hear what your experience has been. Um, hit, up, hit me up on the contact form at sqlworkbooks.com. Be really interested to know just how your team does it because you know, if people are working on code and they aren't aware that there's a frozen plan, that can get confusing. <laughs> that is a situation that you want to avoid. Getting to this week's question for Dear SQL DBA. Here's the story of the change in index maintenance. Before the change, the index maintenance was just offline index rebuild. So simple job that just rolled through and kind of bulldozed and rebuilds all the indexes. This was replaced with a smarter index maintenance job. The smarter job skips indexes that have less than a thousand pages. And if an index is less than 5% fragmented, it skips that too. If an index has between five and 30% fragmentation, it will be reorganized. If an index has more than 30% fragmentation, it will be rebuilt online. But now that the new job is in place, some queries in production are slower. Could this be changed by the index maintenance job? Could this be because our job got smarter? So simplifying the question, we went from rebuilding all of the indexes offline to having some indexes rebuilt online, some indexes reorganized, and some indexes skipped. Now, when I talk about things today, I'm just thinking of classic B tree indexes in SQL Server 2005 and higher. Nobody asked questions about column store rebuilds or hecaton rebuilds. We're just talking our good old row store friends and maintaining those. Alter index rebuild. What's the difference between rebuild and reorganize is kind of the part of the heart of this question. When we run rebuild, the word rebuild, it, it really means it. We get a fresh new index out of this and that's all levels. So the root page, 
any intermediate pages that it has, as well as the leaf, are all rebuilt into a glorious new index palace. Because it's rebuilding the index, it's all or nothing, meaning if we cancel in the middle of a rebuild, it's going to have to roll it back. It can't just leave it half built. <laughs> but because we're building a new index, we can do things like change settings on the index if we want to adjust, say, the fill factor setting. And maybe it was 100% fill factor before, but I want to say, hey, leave 5% empty on the pages when you do index maintenance. I can change that setting during a rebuild. If I have Enterprise Edition, I can specify that I want to use multiple cores. I can, I can say the max stop that I want to use. And I also can choose to use an online rebuild in Enterprise Edition. It's mostly online. At the end of the, the rebuild operation, it's got to get a brief exclusive lock to tell the metadata about the beautiful work that it did. And in 2014 and higher, in SQL Server 2014 and higher, we get cool new options where we can even say, hey, when you get to that part with the exclusive lock, wait at a low priority so you don't cause a big old blocking chain. Very, very cool. Alter Index Reorganize is a little different. And Alter Index Reorganize is very cool in its own right. It crawls through the existing index structure. It doesn't build a new one. When we reorganize, we send out one CPU. It's always single-threaded to roll on through the leaf of the index and defragment as it goes. It will apply existing settings that you have on the index. So if you previously set a fill factor of 95, it'll as it works on it, it will apply that fill factor. But because it's just working on little parts of the index, one great thing about reorganize is if you cancel it, it just stops where it is and is like, ah, all right, I won't do anymore. It doesn't have to undo everything it did since it started working on that index. Reorganize is also online. Even in your cheap bargain basement editions of SQL Server, Reorganize is online. It can be slow because it's just one thread, but it doesn't cause big blocking havoc in your SQL Server, which is pretty cool. Well, what about performance? There's something important that's different between rebuild and reorganize that I haven't mentioned yet. Alter index rebuild gives you a nice rebuilt index and as part of the deal with your glorious new index has updated statistics. When you run alter index reorganize, it doesn't update statistics on the index. It doesn't do anything related to that. And statistics and their freshness can be really critical to performance in SQL Server. Statistics are associated with indexes, but their own, they are their own thing. Statistics are small lightweight objects that describe the data in your table. And it's really important. Describing the data is really important because let's say you're the SQL Server optimizer and you're going to run a query and you're going to join two tables. And there's a where clause on one of the tables limiting some of the rows. And the, the table has you know 10 million rows, but it's got a where clause on one of the columns. You're going to join it to the other table. You're going to want to have a way to guess, OK, how much is that where clause going to limit the rows in that table? After I apply that where clause, am I going to have 10 rows? Am I going to have 10,000 rows? The amount of rows that I'm going to have is going to determine, do I need to build little temporary objects behind the scenes to perform this join? Or can I, for every row that comes back, just go do something else in the other table? Also, if I'm going to do something like a sort, how much memory do I need to allocate to do that sort? I mean, the number of rows and, and the size of the data is really going to matter. Statistics are what describe how many rows do you have and what values are distributed across those rows. And they, they don't take up a lot of space. There are small summaries of the data and the distribution in the table. Statistics, when you build an index, when you create an index in SQL Server, that index automatically has statistics associated with it. You don't create them separately for indexes. The index is 
They have a statistic friend. Even columns, as long as you haven't messed with the default database settings and you've left on automatic creation of column statistics, just when you run queries in SQL Server, those joins and those where clause predicates, SQL Server is going to dynamically create statistics on individual columns so it can guess about what values you have in the column and how many rows you have for different values, even if you don't have an index on that column or an index with a leading key on that column. You can also manually create indexes on sets of columns if you want. So you can get really fancy with this. You can even create filtered statistics. All sorts of things are possible <laughs> in this wild world. But these are really important to, perform to performance. And having your statistics updated is often, I mean, not always, but often important to performance. There's a classic problem called the ascending date key pattern. And I, I've run into this pattern before. The first time I ever learned about statistics in SQL Server was because I'd run into the ascending date key pattern. Let's say we have a table named dbo.transactions. And one of the columns in dbo.transactions is last modified date. We have an index on last modified date. And we're frequently querying the, the transactions table just looking for recent rows, rows that have been modified since a, a given value in last modified date. So it's got 100 million rows, just round number. And at the highest, when we look at the statistic on the last modified date column for the index statistic, it you know, describes the data in the table. And the most recent last modified date that it knows about is today at 2 p.m. Just after 3 p.m., I load a million rows into the table. So it now has 101 million rows. But the statistics on the last modified date index, they aren't updated. In SQL Server, in most versions of SQL Server, most older versions of SQL Server, and even new versions, depending on your settings, statistics will only automatically update when you modify about roughly 20% of the data in a column. If we've got 100 million rows, that's a lot to modify, right? So we just put 1 million rows in. So at 4 p.m., I query for rows whose last modified date is today at 3 p.m. or later. I mean, that's a million rows. Just after 3 p.m., I loaded a million rows. So I'm gonna get a million rows back. But SQL Server looks at my statistic and the highest known time in my statistic is 2 p.m. It's like, oh, you want rows that were modified after 3 p.m. But according to the statistics, the, the highest date it knew about when the stats were updated is 2 p.m. So I'm gonna guess one row. Depending on what I'm doing in my query with that 1 million rows, I could get an execution plan that vastly underestimates how much data it's going to join, how many rows are gonna come out of that. There might be sorts elsewhere in the query. This could create a big problem. Now, SQL Server is getting smarter about the ascending key problem. Remember I said I ran, by, when I, I, for, I ran into this long ago. Well, SQL Server 2014 introduced a new cardinality estimator not that long ago. And it, it got smarter where in this situation, it'll look at the column and it'll be like, okay, well, the highest date value I've got is for 2 p.m. But, you know, looking at this table, it looks like you, it looks like you often put rows in this table. <laughs> so it will not just guess one, it will guess a larger number. This is controlled by database compatibility level though. You want, if you want to use this feature on SQL Server 2014, you have to make your database compatibility level. And now I'm saying this, remember, I believe it's 120, but the highest available compatibility level on SQL Server 2014. We also in SQL Server 2016 have new options to control the uh, cardinality estimator. There is a database uh, scope option for that. There's all sorts of fancy new stuff. So uh, there's even a new hint in SQL Server 2016 Service Pack 1 
we want to hint that we want to use the old one, cool new stuff. Before SQL Server 2014, we did have some ways to try to get SQL Server smarter than this. We have some trace flags. One of them is trace flag 2389. And it would try to find places to where it could improve this estimate, but it was dependent upon behind the scenes SQL Server recognizing a column as ascending or descending, and it didn't always work for everyone because that didn't always get recognized. So the, the new cardinality estimator is an interesting option. Of course, you're getting more than just this improved estimate on uh, ascending date keys. The new cardinality estimator does a whole lot of things differently. So you want to test this carefully and make sure it's right for you. And you may have some queries get faster and some queries get slower. If more queries get faster, you want to go for it, but you do want to evaluate. Uh, do you get regressions on your queries? That new SQL Server 2016 query store feature is a great way to test things and see if you uh, get regressions. But moving on, SQL Server is getting even smarter in a different way too. Remember how I said those stats only automatically update when about 20% of the data changed? Well, in SQL Server 2008 R2, Service Pack 1, we got a trace flag to make the algorithm for this smarter. That's trace flag 2371. And I believe this trace flag was introduced for SAP because this was announced, I believe, first on the SAP blog. SAP in SQL Server has tables with lots and lots of rows on them. The improved algorithm basically for tables that have large amount of rows, it says we're not gonna use a flat 20%. As you get more rows in the table, the percentage change required to trigger statistics update automatically gets smaller and smaller so that you don't have these huge amounts of rows that have to change to get an automatic stats update just during the day as queries are happening. So that's really cool. In SQL Server 2016, if you're at database compatibility level 130, that new algorithm is automatically in place and you don't have to use trace flag 2371. One of the cool things that's happening in SQL Server 2016 is that improvements like this that we've gotten in the past that require trace flags are becoming mainstreamed, but they were nice enough and smart enough to do it in a way that is tied to the database compatibility level. So if you do have a regression and any change can cause a regression, right? You know. <laughs> you can cough in the near vicinity of something and have a regression. But if you, even if you just suspect it, you can lower the database compatibility level. And now that behavior goes back to the prior behavior um, where it's just a flat uh, 20%. So that's really, really cool. Well, so let's circle. We've gathered a lot of info. Circling back to our question. What may have happened to make the query slower? Well, it's quite possible a lot of systems have data loading in the evening before maintenance. This is a lot of systems I've seen and a lot of systems I work on. We run jobs at night that pull data in or fix data up. And then later on we do our backups and our index maintenance and our corruption checking. Well, it might be that a lot of data is getting churned in in those nightly jobs and that what was happening before is that the offline re-index had a byproduct where it was updating statistics on certain tables where a lot of data had changed, but not enough to automatically update statistics. And the index job was fixing that, so queries the next day were faster. It could also just be, though, that there isn't a big data churn in the evenings. It could just be that throughout the day, enough data changes dynamically that when we get to the point where the index maintenance would run, and I don't even know if it's daily or weekly, it's at the point where the stats are off enough that it's gonna start causing problems and the offline rebuild was updating the statistics there. It might be the ascending date key problem, it might be a different problem where just the statistics are off in an important way. There are, you can absolutely have uh, performance problems related to stats being incorrect that aren't you know, ascending date key related. So good maintenance scripts have to do more than just basing different actions on fragmentation. 
the you want a maintenance index <laughs> you want an index maintenance script that asks some additional questions of you and gives you some options. Things like, do you want to update index statistics? if we skip the index because it's not fragmented or small, or if we reorganize it. Because the index maintenance can actually absolutely be coded smart enough to say, oh, oh, I did rebuild or I skipped this, so I'll update the stats so that they're fresh too. But you want to have that as an option. You also want your index maintenance to ask you about column stats because updating the statistics on your indexes doesn't touch your column statistics at all, right? So you want it to know, hey, do you want also want column stats to be updated. And then in addition, you want it to ask you, do you care whether or not any data has changed? There is these modification counters in SQL Server, which now we have call mod counter. We used to have something called row mod counter. But essentially, the maintenance script can say, hey, does it look like a lot of data has changed in here? And if it doesn't look like anything's changed, I'm not even gonna bother to update the statistics because they're probably fine. It doesn't look like anything's changed, but if it looks like we've changed a bunch of data, we could, we could run the update stat. But if we did an index rebuild, we're gonna leave those index stats alone because they're really good. You don't wanna write this code yourself, but the good news is there are several good free index maintenance solutions out there where people have thought about this and they have written the code for you. I also don't recommend that you do it yourself because if you're like me and you do it yourself, you're gonna take some shortcuts because you've got other stuff to do, <laughs> right? You've got other stuff going on. One shortcut that I've seen people make is when they get frustrated with performance and they hear that the issue might be statistics, they're like, well, I'm just gonna set something up that just updates all my stats with full scan. Column stats, index stats, were stats. We're going to update them all with full scan and then that'll be the end of it. Well, that can backfire on you too. I know. There's always a gotcha. I have run into some environments where their stats update job was just taking hours and comparably their index maintenance job was just like fast. Here's why. Let's say we have a table with a 10 gig clustered index and it's got 10 columns because I like the number 10. Well, two of the columns have indexes, and just for the sake of simplicity, you know, it's just two single column indexes. Those indexes do have index stats on them. The remaining eight columns each have column stats on them because at one time or another, we ran a query that, you know, said where that column was equal to something, and SQL Server automatically created those individual column stats for us. Now, I create a job that runs update stats against this table with full scan. For the two index statistics columns, SQL Server is going to scan those non-clustered indexes. And at least, you know, they're narrow things to scan. But for the eight remaining columns that have individual column stats on them, SQL Server is actually going to scan the table eight times. Which, and you can see this in a trace, right? You can prove this to yourself. And that was how I proved it to myself. Cause I was like, how is this job taking so long? And then I looked at what it was doing and I was like, oh, it's, they just have a lot of columns and they query, you know, the, a lot of them are queried for different things. So they got these little column stats and then updating them with full scan takes forever. If you've got a job that's smart enough to say, hey, has any data changed? And I'm only gonna touch them and I'm gonna let it use a default sampling most of the time, it's gonna be fast, right? So just don't, don't overdo your fix if you're like, oh, the problem must be stats because you could get yourself into, <laughs> you could get yourself into another tangle. This is one of the frustrating things about maintenance is there is no perfect maintenance. If I've got a 100 gig index that's 13% fragmented, what do I want to do? Do I want to reorganize it with a single thread? Well, that could take a really long time, right? It is all online, but then my index maintenance, what's my maintenance window? Or do I want to rebuild it? If I rebuild it in one really big CPU and IO chunk, well, hopefully there's not a bunch of other stuff running right now that is important because I could slow it down. 
And if I'm using something like mirroring or an availability group, that's a lot of change to commit at a single time. I mean, there's, there's not always just one thing that's right. If it was me, and I've got a 100 gig index that's 13% fragmented, I'd kind of let it sit for a little while, right? I believe in sort of higher thresholds than most people. And this is just out of my experience of having um, systems where 13% fragmentation didn't cause a performance degradation because we had data in memory and we had enough memory that having some pages out of order. Now, I'm not saying that any amount of fragmentation doesn't cause a problem, right? Because this is also empty space in the index. We wanna have a balance where we are maintaining things, but there's no perfect maintenance. Of all the options I've talked about, no matter which one you choose, there is going to be someone on the internet who will say that you're wrong. You just have to decide if you wanna care <laughs> whether or not they say that you're wrong, right? But this the thing with maintenance. There, there often are, it's messy. Like life, index maintenance is messy and there's not always a, a safe solution. Now, in this case for our questioner, I think there are safe steps we can take. In this case, what happened is we made a change. After the change, we have a performance problem and there is a suspicion that the change is the cause. Well, whatever the change is, in this case, I would always wanna say, okay, I'm gonna save off information about the queries that got slower because I wanna track these and I don't wanna let them get slow again. And I'm gonna roll back the change and go back to the old way. Yeah, the old index maintenance wasn't great, but whenever we have regression, it makes sense to say, okay, well, let's go back to what it was before while we figure things out and we may redeploy. Don't be afraid to go back unless you have a really good reason not to go back. Then while I've gotten myself some breathing room and I've gotten more information, because maybe I go back to the old index maintenance and those queries are still slow. Maybe this is actually unrelated, but I would find that out by going back to the prior state. While I'm, you know, after I've rolled that back though, what I would do is test out some smarter maintenance solution. Ola Hallengren has free maintenance solution. Uh, Minionware, at minionware.net, they have a re-index maintenance solution. You wanna test these out in a test environment, because they're very configurable and you wanna make sure you find the settings that are right for you, but you don't have to write all this code yourself. So this is a big question and we're gonna tackle part two of this question in another episode. Part two of this is gonna be, if I'm looking at a query and it's slow, how can I tell if it's slow due to bad statistics or if it might be slow due to another reason? Cause can't cover everything all in one podcast. Thanks so much for this question though about index maintenance. I'm really enjoying answering it so much that we're doing two episodes on it and I'm looking forward to the next one. If you have a question for Dear SQL DBA, ask your question at sqlworkbooks.com slash ask. Also at SQL Workbooks, sign up for a free course. We've got a free course on SQL Server Management Studio, shortcuts and secrets that'll save you time when you're working with SQL Server. See you next week.